Governments are essential structures. Imagining a nation without a government would mean imagining a country with no regulation. That means no law and order, no one to defend against external enemies, manage economic conditions, or redistribute income and resources, to mention a few consequences. So needless to say, we need governance, and not just any governance, but good governance. In this quest of ideal administration, democracy is the closest we have gotten, with its central theme being equal opportunity, representation and rights. And as promising as that might sound, and as history tells us, it's far from perfect. More than 2000 years ago, living in ancient Greece, Plato recognized the flaws in democracy and warned people about these potential threats. To take things further, he even proposed a solution to the problem by giving us his idea of an ideal government. And while there are many features in his vision of a perfect government that are controversial and debatable, several others receive universal acceptance. Due to recent events, it would be safe to say that we need these lessons now more than ever. So what faults did Plato find in democracy? Why did one of the greatest philosophers that our planet has ever known, living in one of the most ancient democracies in the history of humanity, not like democracy? Plato believed that the task of ruling a nation should be performed by the finest minds residing in that nation. He argued that for more straightforward professions like shoemaking, carpentering or even plumbing, we always want a specifically trained person for the job. But when it comes to politics and governance matters, we somehow let go of any desire for competence. We presume that everyone who knows how to give votes would also know how to administer a city or a state. And thus, we let democracy turn into demagoguery regardless of their training or whether they have any specific preparation and technical competence. Any person is deemed to be fit for office if they can present themselves as desirable. When we are ill, we do not ask for the most good-looking or the most well-spoken physician. We want someone who has the requisite knowledge to diagnose our ailment and the authority to prescribe a treatment. Why not have the same requirements for the people occupying some of the highest offices in the land and making decisions about public policy and foreign relations and war, potentially impacting millions of people. Someone with specific on-job training would always be more likely to make decisions that fall within the circle of common good. Plato suggested that every person should have an equal chance to showcase their ability and make oneself fit for the complex administration tasks. Only those who have proved their competence should be eligible to rule. Public officials should not be allowed to hold office without specific training. To be suitable for higher office, a person should first have held a lower office well. Only with such checks and balances can we find the people best suited for office, who will rule for the common good and eliminate incompetence from governance. Democracy might promise equality at the outset, but an equal society is not what we find when digging deep. Some people are born rich, some are born poor. Some have access to the best education and some don't. And so, in the absence of economic and educational equality, the tall promise of systemic equality falls apart. Plato desired that, in any case, we must give to every child, and from the very beginning, full equality of educational opportunity. Since no one can predict where we might find talent or genius, so it's only fair that we must seek it impartially everywhere, regardless of class or race or position or privilege. The child of an influential businessman or a politician should start at the same level as the child of a daily wage laborer. And not only should rulers be educated, but also the people who are being ruled. Plato suspected 
and rightfully so, that people are not equipped enough to choose who should lead the land without proper education and knowledge. As a result, they can be easily exploited. A politician making tall promises, assuring to work in the favor of various people's interests, calling himself the protector of the people, can quickly rise to power. As a solution to this, Plato proposed that municipalities and counties and states offer scholarships to all students who show a certain standard of ability, but whose parents were financially unable to see them through the next stage of the education process. He believed that that would be a democracy worthy of the name. Plato might have been a philosopher, but he was well versed with psychology as well. He understood that humans are not content with a simple life. They are acquisitive, ambitious, competitive and jealous. Or in simpler words, they are never satisfied with what they have and always want what others have. As a result, it would only be a matter of time before the focus of democracy shifts from ruling for the common good and the nation's growth to politicians vying for economic prosperity and the political office's power. And this makes one ask if the government itself is filled with chaos and takes away more from its citizens than it gives back, how is it possible to persuade the individual to obey the laws and confine their ambitions within the circle of the total good? To deal with this, Plato suggested that leaders and heads of state should set aside every other business and dedicate themselves entirely to the maintenance of governance, making this their sole profession and engaging in no work which does not fulfill this objective. They shouldn't own property or accumulate wealth beyond what is necessary. And when you think about it, it does make sense. Would it be ideal if a surgeon or a construction worker focused on anything else than the work that they are expected to do to the best of their ability? Or if your doctor was more concerned about making money off of you than treating your ailment? Then why is it okay for a heads of state to have any other focus than governance? Unless this conflict of interest is eliminated, democracy cannot be efficient and the nation cannot achieve its peak potential. It might seem like revolutionary thinking today, but even 2000 years ago, Plato held the opinion that the division of labor must be by aptitude and ability, not by gender, and that there should be no discrimination based on the grounds of gender, especially in education. He believed that a girl should have the same intellectual opportunities as a boy, the same chance to rise to the highest positions in the state. And if a woman shows herself capable of political administration, she should be allowed to rule. It would be safe to assume that Plato knew that if almost half of a nation's entire population is going to be excluded from the democratic process, then that nation might as well not take the pains of calling itself a democracy. Now, are some of these ideas overly idealistic? Probably. But it is our task to adapt these ideas to our times and circumstances. Because there is nevertheless a value in painting these ideas. One of the biggest blessings of human existence is that we can use the gift of imagination to think of a better world. We can think of what can be and if we strive for it, we can turn some of it into what is. Because at the end of the day, the state of a nation depends on the state of its citizens. Because the good man will act lawfully even in the unlawful state. So what we need are leaders and guardians who rise above individual greed and aspire for the growth of the nation and work to set up a system where universal education is the norm and people, regardless of gender, irrespective of class or race or economic backgrounds, receive equal opportunity to rise to the higher ranks in society. Because as Plato said, we need not expect to have better states until we have better men.